Welcome to an all-new episode of Get Lit with Leanna, the podcast. Join me as I sit down with a new guest author in each episode to discuss their books, careers, and everything in between. Today, I'm joined by New York Times bestselling author, Catherine Sender, to talk about her new book, Hello Stranger. I've been such a fan of Catherine's books for the longest time. I've loved every book she's ever put out that I've read, and I'm so excited to have her on the show today to not only talk about her new release, which is friggin' amazing, but also some of her book-to-movie adaptations, with one of them coming out really, really soon. The movie of Happiness for Beginners is coming out on Netflix at the end of the month. So I had such a fun time chatting with Catherine about the trajectory of her career, what it's like to see her books be made into movies, and of course, all the key parts of this new novel, including all of the research that went behind the whole premise of face blindness, how she kind of was introduced to this topic, and why she wanted to write a love story with this as part of the plot. I really love this conversation. I think you will too. So with a further ado, my conversation with the one and only Catherine Center starts right now. Welcome, Catherine, to the podcast. I'm very excited to have you here today. I've been a very big fan of all of your books for quite some time, so I'm super excited that we're finally getting the chance to link up and chat, especially about this book, because I actually think Hello Stranger could be like my favorite of yours yet. Oh, wow. I'm really excited about this. So first of all, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know we're a week out from pub date as this is being recorded. So I'm sure you have a million things going on. So I'm super excited to chat. But how are you feeling knowing that this book is going to be out there like very soon? By the time everyone's listening to it, it'll be available. I am very excited to get this book out there. You know, it's um, it was such a joy to write this book. You know, it it was like, I've found more and more as I get older that the books that I'm writing are the way that I sort of make my own sunshine in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I love hanging out with the characters. I love seeing what they do. I love finding the little ways that they surprise me and the ways that they kind of look after each other. And um, I feel so much love for this book that I just hope that other people will, I hope it will lift other people up to read it the way that it lifted me up to write it. That's so nice. I'm sure. Well, it's just such a like a feel good, interesting story. It's so different. Like I was so not expecting it when picking it up. Even after reading the synopsis, I was still like totally taken on a trip. But before we get into that book, I would love to just know a little bit more about your writing background, knowing you've had such an accomplished career and like being so like decorated, all of your books have done so well commercially. Like, how did you start writing? Like, take me back. For years ago, when all of this whole thing started. Yeah, I decided that I wanted to be a writer when I was in the sixth grade. Like, that was my moment. Mm-hmm. And um, it was because I was very, very awkward in the sixth grade. And I was very miserable. And um, I had two best friends who were also awkward and miserable. And we got this idea that we should write fan fiction about the 1980s boy band Duran Duran. I love it. And so we did, you know, that's what we did during the whole year. And we, um, it was so blissfully, magically fun, you know, like in a year of misery where I was so hard on myself all the time and so miserable and so cranky and so sort of desperate and unhappy Um, this was the sunshine in that year. And we would write all week and then we would get together on the weekends and we would have sleepovers and we would read our novels to each other, you know, in installments. And that was sort of my first taste of like the sort of sweet nectar that fiction is in life, the way that it can like change your perspective and give you something to look forward to and create hope in your life, even when, you know, there is none, you know, it, how it can transport you and and change how you see yourself and the world around you. I mean, all of it, all the good things about fiction sort of showed up for me that year. And yeah. from then on, that was what I wanted to do. I didn't always think it was going to happen, but it's what I always wanted, you know, from then. So like, take me back to that first book that was published. Like, what was that experience like getting an agent getting a book deal. I mean, obviously having this dream since you were 11, 12 years old, being in sixth grade, like what was that whole reality like of actually accomplishing a crazy childhood goal? Yeah. Yeah. So I decided I wanted to be a writer when I was 12 and I did not actually manage to publish 
anything at all until I was 32. So it was two decades. And I wasn't like doing other things, you know, in the interim. Like wow. it wasn't like I went off and was an astronaut or something. Like the <laughs> whole time I was trying to be a writer. So I, you know, went through high school and I edited the school newspaper and I edited the creative writing magazine. And then I went off to Vassar College and I majored in English and creative writing and I wrote a creative thesis and I won the Vassar College Fiction Prize. And actually the same week that I won that prize, I also kissed a really cute boy from my art class. (laughs) And then on on the drive home from Vassar to Texas, from New York to Texas, I was uh, debating the whole time with my mom on the drive home, like which was the bigger accomplishment, you know? (laughs) That's a big week in your life. It was very big. big. I was team art guy. My mom was team fiction. (laughs) Yeah. So I came home and I uh, went to grad school in creative writing. I got a master's in fiction writing, which turns out to be a degree that qualifies you for no jobs. And, uh, and then really from graduate school for like the next eight years, I was just trying to get published and failing. I was sending short stories to the New Yorker and getting rejected. That's what I did for eight years. And in the meantime, I was teaching creative writing to little kids and I was working in a bookstore. So I was having fun. I got married. You know, I had a baby. Other things were going on. But mostly I was just failing at being a writer. And it wasn't until after I had my daughter, you know, I had never like done any babysitting. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I think everybody has a pretty steep learning curve on babies. Mine was just vertical. It was just straight up vertical. I had no idea what to do with her. It was so overwhelming. And for about a year and a half after she showed up in my life, I didn't write anything, like not even a grocery list, like nothing. Wow. And then um, I missed it. You know, I missed writing every big, important thing that had ever happened to me. I had written about sort of ad nauseum, you know, and journals and poems and essays and stories. And so one day I was complaining about this to my sister. I was like, I just haven't written anything in in like over a year and I feel weird. And my sister was like, you should write a novel about being a mom. You know, she was like, you should write like a fun, funny comic novel about being a mom. And then she just kind of went, how hard can that be? And they were like the perfect words at the perfect moment. The next day I woke up with an idea for a story in my head. I started writing and it wrote itself. I had a first draft in six weeks. And, you know, this was after years and years of studying creative writing. But really the studying I was doing before was much more kind of literary. It was much darker. You know, it was not, I was not letting myself have fun in those stories. And it was like, once I gave myself permission to have fun with the stories, everything changed. And um, that story wound up becoming my first novel to ever get published. And that's a whole story, which I'm happy to share with you. But, you know, I think most people who are published writers have a different story and also the same story, which is that they just stumbled on some good luck. You yeah. know, they ran into somebody who could help them in some way. They mm-hmm. they didn't quit for long enough that they stumbled on some good luck, which is basically what happened to me. Wild. So what was it like getting that, like, first bit of news that your book was a New York Times bestseller. Like what was that kind of, because now you've done it, you've, you've made the goal a reality, you've written, you're an author. And now like your books are getting this type of type of recognition. Like I can't imagine what 12 year old you must have been (laughs) at that moment. No, I wish I could time travel and like pat her on the shoulder and be like, guess what? (laughs) Things are going to get a lot better for you. Um, Yeah. You know, uh, so that first book came out in 2007. So I don't know what the math even is on that, but I think it was like 16 years ago. And then uh, I did not hit the New York Times bestseller list for six more novels. So Mm -hmm. um, the book that finally hit the list was called How to Walk Away. And that came out in 2018. So like 11 years later. And, Mm -hmm. And that's great. I mean, you know, it's great to ever even hit the list at all. I'm beyond grateful for that. Um, but, you know, it, it, my definitions, my my career has kind of been like a big slow burn, you know, like there's there's like there are moments of sort of great joy and celebrating. And then there are lots of moments of just like struggling and trying to figure it out and hustling. And like, how do I because, you know, you get the book deal and you think, oh, this is my happy ending. But then you have to find people who actually want to read your book. And that's a whole different <laughs> project, right? Because everybody's yeah. busy. Everybody's got, you know, their shows they need to watch and their kids they need to take care of and their jobs. And so, you know, I thought, you know, I did have this feeling that like once I had a book out there that everybody was just going to drop everything and go read it. And that's not at all how it happens. You have to like 
convince them that it's worth their time. And you have to find the people who are going to like the thing that you do because mm-hmm. everybody likes different stuff. So yeah, it was a, it was a very sort of slow motion process of like a little bit of success and then a lot of struggling and then a little bit of success and then a lot of struggling. But I will say that I think that made it all the sweeter when in 2018, you know, we got this amazing news um, and I was already on book tour. I was driving to San Antonio um, mm-hmm. and I was walking into a bookstore that I had done an event at a few years before that actually no one had come to. Right. <laughs> But this time, circle moment, this, though. Yeah, and every writer has had that happen, right? Like every writer has had like a book event they went to that somehow the word didn't get out or everybody <laughs> was just randomly busy. But um, I walked into that store, you know, on this particular night and it was packed mm-hmm. and I got to sort of stand up and say, I just got this call from my editor that we just hit the New York times list. And it was, um, you know, everybody cheered. And wow. then I went out that night, my mom was with me and we went out and got, um, you know, we had a nice dinner and we had some champagne. Yeah, it was great. I mean, it was, you know, you have to, we have a friend who says never miss an opportunity to celebrate. And I fully agree with that. You know, when these little things, even little things happen or big things, you know, you just got to, You got to jump in and savor it and feel so grateful. For sure. So there's been so many, like, as you said, it's been a slow burn, but I feel like lately it's just been like burn, 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 burn. And I feel like so excited and so happy because obviously I'm such a fan of all of your books, but I'm loving like all the attention they're getting from, from various medium, like book of the month or New York times or, but the craziest thing. And I think you would kind of agree is these film adaptations that are happening. (laughs) And it's most, it's my favorite thing. I talk about it all the time beyond, like, it's my favorite thing ever getting romance books adapted into movies. It's, there's nothing I love to watch more. And I loved, loved, loved The Last Hus- the Lost Husband. I loved it. And my grandma loved it. We were like watching it together. We still talk about it to this day, like how stunning Josh Jamel is in it. And it's just like such a movie that we both really, really like bonded over. But now yeah. obviously Happiness for Beginners is coming out and you're doing this thing all over again. So tell me what it's like to be a romance writer and see your stories like just like come to life on the screen like what is that experience like it's beyond it's beyond thrilling and it's also very trippy because um for both movies they were both adapted and directed by the same person so she um so she was the screenwriter so she took the book and turned it into a screenplay and then she also directed the movie her name is Vicky White and um she uh very kindly invited me to come to the set for both of the movies. So I got to be an extra in both of the movies. So if you watch The Lost Husband on Netflix, you can see me at the farmer's market sort of looking quite panicked, you know, like (laughs) suddenly realizing that I do not know how to act. Um, But I, I actually, in that movie, I like purchased goat cheese from my own main character at a farmer's market. So that's very trippy. That's so Um, crazy. And then I also got to uh, be an extra in this new one coming out, Happiness for Beginners, because um, which is amazing because it, they were shooting during COVID. So mm-hmm. it was actually really hard to get onto the set. But mm-hmm. Vicky made sure that she got me up there. I, they filmed in Connecticut. I flew from Texas to Connecticut. And then I had to like quarantine in the hotel for a couple of days. Yeah. But um, that was, th- I mean, it's thrilling. You're standing there watching a version of your characters like walking around in the real world. And you know, it's not them intellectually, you know, these are just actors, Um, but also like, it feels like them. And it's, it's really, it's like a mind bending experience. It's really blissful. And can I also say that when they were doing uh, the lost husband and I was on set, I did get to meet Josh Duhamel, um, which was, um, I'm sure just such a drag and (laughs) like there's so many other places you would have wanted to be like more than that. Yeah. (laughs) You know, he is, I, I, this may or may not be a shock to you, but he is very, very handsome. And, um, and he's also like, he's like the fame, you know, it just like rises off of him like steam. Like he's so famous and so handsome and just such a movie star kind of person. And I had just never seen anything like that before in real life. And every time I tell the story of my husband's in the room, he's like, uh, hello, you, you know me. And I'm like, of course, obviously you, <laughs> um, but Josh Demel is so ridiculously handsome that he actually came over to talk to me on the movie set and just say, hello, you know, like, hi, I heard you read the book. It's so nice to meet you. I'm Josh. And I panicked and I forgot how to talk. Like, 
I, I forgot how to make words. Like the whole quadrant of my brain that makes language just shut right down. Yeah. And I just stood there staring up at him like a wide mouth bass. My mouth was just opening and closing. There were no words coming out. And he was asking me questions, like easy little questions. Like, so are you from Texas? Like, yeah. I know the answer to that question. That's not rocket science. But I couldn't make any words come out of my face. It was the weirdest thing ever. Oh, my gosh. Felt like a rotisserie chicken at the grocery store. Like my skin got all hot and crackly and I was kind of like dizzy and spinning around. So that was very fun. I also got to go to the set and I got to meet um, Ellie Kemper um, on the Happiness for Beginners set. And I got to meet uh, Luke Grimes, which was lovely. He gave me a side hug right here yeah. on the Never shoulder. Wash it Don't wash it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and also I got to meet, um, I did not get to meet Nico Santos, who's in the movie, because he was not there that day. He was not in that scene. But I got to meet Blythe Danner, who plays the grandma. And that was a big thrill because wow. I love her. I've loved her since I was little. Yeah. And um, so I got to hang out in the background of the scene in the shot, uh, pretending to drink champagne at a wedding with Blythe Danner. I was like, this is a peak experience. Like, it's not going to get any better than this. Wild. So what was it like for, I mean, both of these films, like seeing them, like watching them, did you watch them with friends and family? Like being on set, I imagine is like so extravagant and it's crazy to see the whole behind the scenes, but then to actually see like the finished product all finessed and put together with the music and all the mixing and stuff. Like, what is that like to like see it in that, from that lens? Yeah, it's very, uh, it's very thrilling. I mean, there's, I, I almost don't have words for it. You know, the Lost Husband movie was supposed to come out in theaters all over the country in April of 2020, which was, of wow. course, the month that every single movie theater in America shut their doors because of COVID. And so we did not have, you know, we were going to have a premiere. We were going to do the whole thing. None of none of that happened. Um a friend of mine came over and like decorated my front door on the night <laughs> that it got you know quietly released on a streaming service. And the kids and I and my husband all sort of sat around and watched it. Yeah. Um, this time around, of course, the world is a very different place. And so um, we are going to have like a sneak peek event with the director in Houston and um, at this big theater in the Museum of Fine Arts. And so that's going to be really fun because at last we get to sort of celebrate together, like in a group with other humans, you know, in real life. Yeah, very amazing. So exciting. Okay, so now why we're here today to talk about Hello Stranger. I love this book so much and I don't want to ruin it or spoil it. And I know it's like kind of funny to say, but like the best way to read this book is to go in blind. And I know given the context of the book, it's like a funny expression to use, but it's really true. And I'm happy that I read the synopsis before reading it. But I really don't think anyone needs to. But I always like to provide everyone listening just like a little hook to like why you should pick it up. So do you want to like provide everyone with a little yeah 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 Yeah. so it's it's basically about a woman who is a portrait artist like a struggling portrait artist who finally gets her big break and right as that's happening she gets this condition called face blindness and face blindness is a real condition um that allows you to still see, I mean, you're not, you're not blind. You can see everything except the one thing you cannot see are human faces, because that's a very specialized part of the brain that recognizes faces and can kind of snap them together. And if that part of the brain gets messed with in some way, it can impact your ability to do that. So she needs to paint the best portrait of her life. (laughs) And just as that's happening, she gets this condition. And so she has to figure out how to do that, right? What is how do you see people when you can't see people the way you always saw them? And how do you make a piece of art when it's not going to look like what everything you've ever made before has looked like? And in all of this chaos, as she's sort of freaking out and trying to figure it all out, um, she meets these two different guys in different arenas of her life. And she gets sort of caught up in this fun, very swoony, very unexpected uh, love triangle that happens. So that's, So it's like sort of half, and this is true of all my books, right? It's like half personal growth, right? Half a character who has to struggle with something hard and overwhelming and figure it out and pull wisdom out of a situation that she's never faced before. And that's sort of the portrait painting part of it. And then it's sort of half swoony love story, right? Because I really love swoony love stories. I love wisdom and love stories. And so I'm always trying to write stories that allow us to get both of those things out of the story. 
And you do it so well every single time. But there's something about this story that just like really captured my attention. And I just need to know how you came up with this concept because it's yeah. so out there. And I have to be totally transparent. Like when I like first heard of facial blindness, I had never heard of that before. And the yeah. first thing I did was Google it because obviously right. I want to like know more about it a little bit. And I was really curious to try to like understand what someone who has facial blindness sees when they see a face. And like, yeah. clearly you can't really Google that because it's like someone's like, I was, I was hoping that Google could provide me like some AI imagery of someone that had it and can explain it, but there was no real, like clear distinction. So firstly, I would just love to know like how the concept came to you. And secondly, I would love to know like what kind of research you had to do in order to like execute this as accurately as possible. Yeah. Well, okay. So the, the first time I ever heard of face blindness, I was listening to a radio show called This American Life. I love it. And they were doing a, a Valentine's Day issue and telling lots of little love stories, you know, over the course of the episode. And one of the love stories that they told was about a woman who fell in love with a guy who had face blindness. And so... um it really caught my attention because it just sparked all these questions for me about like, what would it be like to fall in love with someone who can't see your face or the flip side, if you, if you were the person who couldn't see faces, what would that be like? Like what, what how much of seeing a person involves your eyes and how much of it is, you know, your heart and like all these sort of big questions about it. how do we get to know people? And so I was thinking about that, that story that they told on that radio program did not end very happily. Oh. <laughs> you know, I mean, they didn't stay together, um, but but it really lodged in my head. They were talking about how, or she was telling the story and saying one of the things that she loved about this guy was that the way he looked at her was so different from the way anybody else had ever looked at her, you know, that he was just really looking, right, mm -hmm. and really paying attention. And anyway, that stuck in my head, and I kind of put it in my you know, on my shelf of like potential story ideas for someday. Okay. Um, and, you know, sometimes that happens. I, I have hundreds of ideas just sort of back there, back there on the shelf that, um, you know, at a certain point, they just kind of, there's a moment where I can see them being put together with something else. Okay. And then the story kind of roars to life. And that's kind of what happened with this. But this story did not at all turn out the way I thought it was going to because I did a huge amount of research. And the more I learned about how the condition works, um, the more it changed the story, right? Because the story kind of grew out of everything that I learned because I did a ton of research. I listened to podcasts and I read books and I read articles and I read Oliver Sacks, um, who wrote Awakenings. Um, he had it. Uh, Jane Goodall has it. Brad Pitt has it. There's lots of people who've written about their experiences with it. Um, so yeah, I did a lot of studying on that. And I will say um, one thing that might be helpful is um, I watched a TV series on it. And one of the things that they did to help you understand what it's like, what the experience is like, is they would take faces and they would kind of put an oval around the face so you couldn't see the person's hair. Mm -hmm. So it's just the face. And then they would flip it upside down. And what happens when they do that is, you know, it's a face. You can tell it's a face. You can see that there are eyes and a nose and a mm -hmm. mouth, mm -hmm. but it doesn't look like a face. It doesn't register as a face. It's not any kind of face you can recognize. And so I actually have one of those on my website. So if you're ever bored, you can go Absolutely. over to com and go to the Hello Stranger page, scroll down because um, I took a bunch of like famous people whose faces you would totally know if they were right side up and put them upside down and you know, I'd be so curious to know, can you tell who it is before you flip it over? <laughs> you should do I, it's really hard to know, you know, and I've looked at them so much now that I can kind of recognize all these people upside down, but I think it's very hard to tell, you know, I've taken a few quizzes online. Yeah. I was picturing more of like a Picasso, like painting, just like an eye here, a mouth here, like kind of like a, like a mishmash of features, but it's so interesting. Like not this obviously has nothing to do with the book, but the fact that it's only facial, like it's only a face. That is what you're blind to. Like in the book, like Sadie could see her dog peanut perfectly fine. Like that's yeah. what's crazy. Yeah. Me, like that I kept getting hung up on. And I kind of, while reading the book, had to keep remember, remembering like, okay, but she can't see faces. Like it's, it's so well written. And it's like, it's so intricately where you're reminded constantly that she's not able to see them, but it's not like it's the focal point of the story. And I think it kind of goes back to the fact that like that whole conversation of like, well, how do you fall in love? Like, is it, is it just looks, is it with your heart? Like, how do you feel love? Like that whole part of it. And I loved how you kind of explored that in the story. 
obviously given I'm a huge romance reader, like the, the love story of this all just totally captured my attention. And I loved that it's a like a, a love triangle, but it's the most unconventional love triangle because of obviously like the whole twist and the whole, everything at the end. What was that like to write? And was it fun? Was it hard? Like, what was the outlining process like of that type of using that trope in this story? Yeah, I have to say, we're talking about her dog, Peanut, and I have to say there's a dog barking in the background, and that is okay. my dog, who looks uh, exactly like the Peanut that's on the uh, cover of the novel, because I actually sent the um, cover designer, like, a picture of my dog. I was that's like, can we just see my dog? Um, sorry, she's, she's a barker. Um, nope. So, uh, yeah, you know... Um, I've already forgotten the question. What was the question you just asked me? How you use like the love triangle trope in the story, what the outlining process was like. Yeah. Well, so yeah. So sorry. I was so distracted with my dog. I was like, All good. My dog was like, be quiet, be quiet. I'm doing something right now. <laughs> um, so okay. So uh I do try to outline. I'm not a great outliner. Um, I you know, in the writing world, they have um a term for it. They're plotters and pantsers. Yeah you know, and plotters plot everything out and pants is right by the seat of their pants. And I'm a, like a hybrid in between those two things. I always try to plot things out, but I also find that I can't really, I can't really see what's happening in the story until I can see what's happening in the story. Okay. You know, so I find that everything for me kind of grows out of what just happened or maybe not everything, but like a lot of it. And so with this one, uh, so much of what happens in the story grew out of the research because I did wind up interviewing a woman who's a science writer who I've fallen madly in love with because she's just the coolest person ever. Her name is Sadie Dingfelder. And um, she okay. writes, she wrote a, an article for um, the Washington Post called My Life with Face Blindness. Mm -hmm. And I read this article and it just like, for me, it kind of snapped all the lights, right? It made me kind of, I was like, I get it. Like I'm getting this now. And um, so I interviewed her. Um, I also interviewed a, a Harvard researcher um, named Joe DeGudis, who also does like he works on face blindness as his research. So I, you know, I was trying yeah, to really pulled all it. of these people's names into your story. Also, like that's amazing. Yeah. So I was Sadie was actually already on my list as a possible, okay. woman. but but then when I got to know the like the other Sadie, the real Sadie, yeah, I, I liked her so much. Like I just got such a good vibe from her that I was like you know, I think this is kind of bumping that name Sadie right up to the top of the <laughs> list, right? Love and it. Joe was already on my list. But then um, but then I did kind of play with things, you know, like Oliver, I threw that in because of Oliver Sacks, who yeah. is you know, who wrote about face blindness quite a bit. And yeah. I was just like a little like tip of the hat to, you know, folks who are out there sort of talking about this stuff. I'm so sorry about my dog. This no, don't be at all. Um, so, uh, so the, the, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm never sure how much to talk about with the twist, but I did try to write a story where it would be fun either way. Like if you figured out the twist early, that it would still be fun to wait and see what was going to happen when the characters figured it out. But, um, but also maybe you wouldn't figure it out. I'm not a person who ever figures things out early. I didn't I'm, figure it out. So I yeah. was like that. And then I was like, I have to go back and read. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think there's kind of like two different kinds of brains. There are brains that like know how to do this and like to do it early, like mystery readers, thriller yeah. readers, they like to get in there and like work out the puzzle. Yeah. But um, I don't, I mean, I, I just kind of like get in like a little, you know, like boat and float down the river of the story yeah. and see what's going to happen. So, and I thought I wasn't sure which way it would go, but I tried to figure that maybe 50% of the people would figure it out early and 50% wouldn't, but I hoped it would be a good read either way. And um, that is basically what's kind of happened. You know, um, I looking at reviews, Views coming in, I would say about half the people figured it out early, but still had fun. Um, and half the people um, were like, got to the moment of the big reveal and were like, oh, uh -huh. yeah. but it, it's, uh, it, it was fun. That's a new thing for me. I haven't tried to do um, something like that before. So it was, yeah. it was a fun challenge for sure. It was, it's such a fun book to read. And like, I, again, I encourage everyone to pick it up and kind of just go into it, not knowing what to expect. But now I know like everyone is just everyone like he's like me and they're greedy. So they're going to want to know, like, what are you working on next? Because we can always expect a great book from you. And we always know you pump them out like you do not deprive us of books. So what's <laughs> what's going on next? What can we talk about? Ah, No, no, no. I, I just turned in my um, my next summer book. So my 2024 book okay. um, is in the can. And it is um, it is I. It is a story that is connected to the bodyguard. 
Okay. So, so, so yeah. excited. Yeah, yeah. So I had this book that came out last summer and um, it was called The Bodyguard. And the main, one of the two main characters in the book was named um, Jack Stapleton. And um, Jack got famous in a m- movie called The Destroyers, like a fictional movie that I made up called The Destroyers. And um, so this book is actually about... This new book is about the screenwriter of The Destroyers, like the guy who wrote the screenplay that made Jack Stapleton famous. And um, it is uh, what I I, I'm madly in love with this story right now. Like, it's like the only thing I want to talk about or think about. And Mm -hmm. basically, um, uh, this guy, his name is Charlie Yates, and he has written a rom-com screenplay. Mm -hmm. And he's a very famous sort of celebrity screenwriter. And he's written a rom-com screenplay and it's terrible. And so that's the opening part of the story is that our main character, Emma, has been hired to um, go and fix it. Like as a ghost writer, like come in and fix this, this Mm -hmm. terrible, terrible screenplay. And she's like so horrified by by it. She's like, this screenplay is a crime against humanity. Like this is the worst thing that's like, this could destroy human civilization as we know it. It is so (laughs) And so she, you know, her job is to go in to this very like world famous screenwriter who has a nice big ego and try and get him to change everything. And so they have to work together and they fall um, madly in love with each other. And it is writing that book was just about the most fun I've ever had. I mean, I just lost my mind with joy. It was, it was a total treat. So I, I can't wait. I wish, I wish I could bring it out tomorrow. Um, it has to go you know, through copy editing and get a cover before that can happen. But yeah, next time. Well, everyone is going to be thrilled to know about this. Cause I know everyone loved the bodyguard and like that this premise just sounds like especially someone like me who's obsessed with as we talked about film and move like movies i can't wait i'm very excited but this was so 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 much fun thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today i like really really can't tell you how much i appreciate it i'm such a fan so this was really really such a treat it was such a treat for me too i love getting to hang out with you and once again i'm so sorry that my dog was barking i'm gonna sit, take her outside yeah. and you know have a word with her be like hey mama was zooming this is not a good <laughs> idea 